welcome to our uh, Go Rory instructor webinar series. Um, and the idea of this is just to get some instructors on a call, have a chat, some conversation, some debate. Uh, and uh, it, once a month, we plan on doing this uh, with like guest speakers uh, from across the industry and across the UK. Because I think it's really exciting getting different ideas and putting people from different backgrounds and that have had different experience all together. And I think good conversation will come out of that. So this is what we're doing with the webinar series. Uh, today, we're talking about how to prepare your business to get ready for the post lockdown boom that's gonna like make you guys quite well off. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, just, like, let's go through that. We've got a bunch of questions that goes around that. And we'll, what we'll do is like, let's try and create some actionable advice for the people listening that they can take away and actually go away and think, ah, I, I can do that and I can actually do that this afternoon or I can do that tomorrow and start getting things ready for them. I think that would be really beneficial for them. Uh, and then I'm sure we'll have tangents uh, here and there, which is all fine. And we hope hopefully to wrap up uh, at about 4 p.m. Um, so uh, today we're joined with Mike Spooner, uh, Jamie Sheriff and Tony Poole. And I, what I'll do is I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. And then once you introduce yourselves, we'll start with the first question. Uh, it's a bit like question time. Hopefully, probably not as uh, as a, much of a car crash as question time, but you know, we'll, we'll go. Uh, Mike, do you want to start us off? Okay, right. Well, I'm Mike Spooner. Um, I'm an ADI, so I run um, an independent school. I drive driving school. Um, I'm also organizer of the driving instructor show and the more recent um, online events um, this 20 and this 21. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Jimmy? Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jimmy Sheriff. I'm an ADI in Edinburgh. Uh, I've been in the ADI for five years. I'm also the chairman of the Edinburgh Lothian Driving Instructors Association. Um, yeah, so that's me. And Tony. Hi, uh, I'm Tony Poole. I'm an ADI uh, working independently in Leeds. Been in ADI for 17 years. Uh, I'm also a fleet trainer and I'm the chairman of the Leeds Driving Instructors Association. Brilliant. Excellent. Right, okay. Uh, with that, let's get started. Let's dive in. I definitely do feel like Fiona, Fiona Bruce right now. So, okay. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go on. Look like you're uh, looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Um, what would you say is the number one thing to, uh, for ADIs to get ready? What's the one piece of advice to get ready for uh, post lockdown? I'll, I'll, I'll do a similar order, uh, Mike, if you want to start with that one. In your car. <laughs> Yeah, mine's filthy. Um, I did think about this really, actually, that's uh, the, the one thing. Um, and it kind of, it probably fit, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other things that sort of pop in with it as well. I would say, actually, the one thing to do would be to um, uh, do a bit of driving, definitely, because it's weird if you if you haven't driven for a week and then suddenly you get in the car, I think, whoa, this is so weird. Think how, think how weird it is for our pupils. Um, yeah. Get in, do some driving, and um, um, do a bit of CPD as well. Just read, read a book. Yeah, whoever, it, whichever one it happens to be, just sort of yeah, re read about around the subject again. Um, it just kind of prods your mind to think about things. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, um, for me, um, great comment about actually going out and doing some physical driving um my one we have to say is, is communicating with pupils now uh we're going to see some massive changes in regards to how we manage calendars due to um test issues which we are definitely going to get um i was lucky enough to go back to work in between the two lockdowns we had last time and uh, i had a lot of pupils whose tests had already been knocked back months ahead did it test standard uh, so I ended up dropping pupils down to one lesson every two weeks, maybe one lesson every three weeks. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm these massive holes in my calendar. Uh, so the waiting list quickly filled in. Uh, so for me, it's going to be communicating, figuring out the state of play with the current pupils who are sitting waiting, find out what's happening, find out if they're still needing to drive even past their test. Some of them have lost their jobs and stuff like that. So start the communication now so that once we are ready to go, you can hit it. Steam ahead. Excellent. Tony. Yeah, I think I would echo, I could I would echo exactly what Mike and Jamie have said. Uh, in terms of having your car ready, cleaned, 
any jobs it needs, any repairs, MOT servicing, things like that. Very good point from Mike about the going out and doing the driving, but also to consider as well while you're out, are there any roadworks? I mean, I've been doing a lot of walking during the lockdowns and the roadworks and, and, and road closures I've come across in our local area have been unbelievable. Uh, so that might be worth it as well. Places you used to go but suddenly can't go. Also with pupils as well, look at test priority which we probably will go on to talk about later. The pupils with the earlier tests coming up, also any health or shielding uh, issues that they might have. Because I would imagine it's all well and, bu well, well and good booking people in and then suddenly 24 hours before, I can't do my lesson because I'm shielding. Try and find all this information out sooner rather than later would be my advice. Yep, perfect. Um, I guess on that, um... We are all three of you guys expecting to go uh, do your first week as a full-time week? Uh, are you just going to dive right in or would you consider maybe doing like a, a half week or like to ease, like, because a lot of EDIs haven't been working for like potentially 10 months or like four months solid. So are, is it, would you recommend doing, just doing a full week or easing yourself back in? Personally, with the messages I'm getting, I think I'll be straight back into it full time. Yeah, full week, okay. I dare not do any other. Yeah. I think I'll be doing it, um, well, reasonably, probably about um, a maximum about six hours a day. So not, um, not sort of massive, massive, but, you know, sort of averagely reasonable. Um, I always find that um, when you restart again, it's really knackering, this job. <laughs> imagine, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I see, well, so, yeah, you want to sort of, yeah, not not sort of not take on too much, but yeah, yeah average reasonable. Yeah, yeah, I'll be filling up as much as I can. Um, I, like I say, it's all really based on. I'm going to end up with these silly gaps in my calendar. I just know that's going to happen, um, but make them work for me. Absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. Okay, uh, I'll move on then from uh, from that and to our next question, which is um, like about managing test dates. Um, what, how? How are you managing your 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 pupils and your test dates, and uh, what kind of piece of advice do you have, Tony? I'll start with you because you just brought it up. Okay, um, I've had, I've actually advised uh, my pupils um, rather than wait for the DVSA email, I advise mine to change their own um, because obviously, if some of them are waiting for DVSA emails, they're then going to get a later date more likely than if they cancelled their own beforehand. You know what I mean? Uh, well, that was the hope anyway. As it turns out, some have got earlier dates and some have got to wait till June, July. Um, in terms of getting people back in, going on to what I said earlier, I think I'll be looking at the ones with tests rather than new starters. Right. Because... You know, as 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 Mike and Jamie will, you know, will um, will probably agree to. You know, historically, tests have always taken priority over you know over lessons, if you like, and pupils with tests. So I'll be looking at managing that and looking at my test dates and getting those pupils in before anybody else, really. Yeah, sorry. Can I just quickly note, note something Tony just mentioned there? Uh, a lot of people don't realise this, but the DVSA's tar system is not actually designed to give you automatically the next date available. It will spool you further out. So it's definitely in people's interest to actually go in and find the first test date available, not automatically. It might just, in classic days, it used to just spin you out seven weeks. At the moment, it's spinning you out three or four months. Um, but yeah, go in and find it. Uh, also on that, there's cancellation services out there. These guys are going to make a lot of money in the next year. But... Mm. It's 12, 13 pounds well spent, in my opinion. Uh, I encourage a lot of my pupils to go on to uh, and then they just bang me a text. Uh, can, I, can, I, can you do this? Oh, 99% of the time I'll always say yes. Um, and yeah, make, make good use of them because it is, it is going to be an issue, a massive issue. Good to know. Oh, I'm going to ask a question actually, which cancellation services do you use? Um, I use one called Driving Test Cancellations for All. Um, there's a few yeah, out there. Based in um, Colchester. 
And Possibly, yeah. I mean, the one I use um, gives you the options for the ADIs to get a kickback mm -hmm. of a couple of pounds if you want, or you can pass the discounts over to your pupils. I just pass the discount over to the people. Mm -hmm. um, but it, there's, there's a few out there. Some, like, you you know, do as many tests as you want. There's, there's loads of them out there. Just Google them. You'll find them. But uh, it's definitely worth, um, you know, using them so that you can get these pupils who have been waiting, some of them, a year and a half now, mm -hmm get through their test you know <laughs> just to finally get them out there um you know they're desperate <laughs> to go out and buy new cars uh, that, that's interesting maybe, maybe there's a business opportunity for for ourselves <laughs> oh yes yeah there's, there's... Oh, oh in the next year <laughs> these services are going to get rammed and yeah. it's just a bot service you know you build Is a it? program yeah yeah you totally know. i mean yeah. i remember they, they all, when uh, the first lockdown happened and they changed the test booking system they added a new page and they added a waiting page and all the bots stopped working <laughs> because none of them knew what to do. Course, that page oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that we're we're not working there. <laughs> that seems yeah. really easy to do. Like, so, like, anyway, you know what? That's not for you, but yeah, okay. I'll yeah, just remember good. who gave you the idea, Michael. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you should do it. You should My do cut's it. 10%. <laughs> and I'll promote it. <laughs> uh, this is recorded, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All this is that, you know, like I said to you earlier, an ADI's dream is to be able to make money in his sleep. Yes. <laughs> that is it. So. Let's catch up after this. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think I'll, that was my. I was going to ask about that. Um, uh, Testes, uh, do you guys? Will you guys be listing out your pupils in a kind of order of who's got the nearest test, or how do you? How do you? How do you actually manage that in practical terms? Uh, <clears throat> I suppose really well. What one I did for the the first end of the first or towards the end of the first lockdown, I. Um, messaged all my pupils um, with a link to fill out a form, basically telling me everything I needed to know. So when they were going to be available, when they wanted their lessons, um, you know, if they um, had a test they hadn't told me about that they put in, because sometimes they don't tell you, do they? They go, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I booked a test. Yeah, I've got a test through. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't tell you, did I? Um, and um, also the amount of lessons they want every week. And then once I get all that back, then I can think, right, okay, I can prioritize you. I can push you to one side. Yeah, I can put you in here, I can put you in there. And everything's all laid out. Um, and I, find, I found that the, 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 the easiest way to do it, just really a, a form, they, 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 they click on the link, they fill in the form, you know, they, they click, back it comes, and then you can, you can, you can easily, Easily manage it all. Perfect. That, that's great. Um, and you guys got anything to add to that? Or... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I kind of harbors back to what I was just saying about communication. Um, yep. Mike's always done it in the form of a document, but um, yeah, just try and get as much information as you can. Um, you already know your pupils. So, you know, as long as they're not slipped far back too far, you should be okay. Sorry, Tony. Well, I think, I think you pretty much said what I would say as well there, Jamie. I did, you know, I never sent out. Um, a physical document as such, but the communication, who's got what test, when they've got it, mm. and still their ability. Because mm. at the end of the day, you know, you've still got to work off your pupil's ability uh, and, uh, and availability. Um, mm. So it was just regular communication. Yeah. Um, and then it, it just seemed to fit. It all just seemed to fit. Then it all got locked down again. All the tests got cancelled. <laughs> um, yeah, another thing to factor in as well, sorry, is uh, a lot of instructors have changed their cars. So you might have to, you know, get a wee, uh, particularly if the, when I was looking at my calendar, I was like, oh my god, I'm two days back and I've got a test, <laughs> you know, um, uh, uh, and I've got a new car <laughs> and people a completely different car to the previous one. So um, they may be that occasion when they go, oh, this that people they'll be fine with a change of vehicle, but you know, this guy over here uh, definitely needs to go to get, get him out for a couple of lessons beforehand. Um, I got a question, question for audience. We'll just we'll just take uh, coming now, I guess. Um, we move on uh, and I think I'll let you guys answer this um, is it fair to assume that we can start uh, we can restart lessons on the 12th of April that's from Chris Whitaker oh. um, what's uh, I guess that, that's probably for England uh, I think because I think Scotland's uh, it would be more delayed but we'll come back we'll, we'll come to Jamie on that afterwards but what do you guys think of 12th of April should you plan for that date yes I think we should actually I mean, that's what um, I'm just due to do, as I said about a, an online form. I'm just to do an, due to do an online form to all my pupils to say, look, um, it's, you know, 
reasonably likely to be the 12th. Um, and if that happens, then I need to know in advance, you know, all your details, what you want, what you don't want, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but I, I think it'll, it's, it's reasonable to assume that will probably happen. But then again, this, what, what, what does anybody know at the moment? We, we can only prepare ourselves for that, I think. <laughs> Tony? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, yes, it's, it's not always good to assume, but you don't want to get to the 11th of April and have the pages of the diary blank. Mm. I think there's going to have to be some planning. And given that the only date at the moment, and I know, I know it's, you don't want to fall foul of assumption because if, if the rates, the infection rates go back up, on the government's five week rolling plan, then it won't be the 12th. But at this moment in time, I think as, as Mike said, I think I think we will, we will be okay for a, an element of planning for the 12th. Whether you're doing five lessons that week, 10 or 20. Of course, the unknown quantity is tests on the 12th because nobody's driven. Yeah. Yeah. And, there's, and there's been, as we all know, there's been stipulations and restrictions on private practice as well. Mm. for essential journey so that's the unknown thing the the the, the um the, the, the tests but I, i'm planning for the 12th as as, as mike alluded to yeah. i did read actually somewhere that we're gonna um open test centers a week after the 12th a week later i can't remember where i read that now. yeah I, I i've heard that too i've heard that too yeah. i'll i'll go yeah. to that jamie uh like i i know we've got some scottish idiots here and in, in the yeah in the chat so uh what is uh what are you planning for uh, so just to mirror what the guys were just saying there um they uh, uh, we're planning uh, two weeks later in scotland it's 26th right. of april um i'm planning on going back to, to work on that day i think we should all plan for going back to work on that day mm -hmm. um one thing i would say so is between now and then you know watch the the the, the covid updates that are coming out to see if they're going to delay because they're not delaying on the day you're typically getting this information two, three weeks beforehand. So you're going to have a little bit of time to adjust if you need to. Um, obviously, we are two weeks behind. Um, and I, I, it very much seems that the, the roadmap now is, you know, we don't want to be going back. So we're putting these dates quite far in advance anyway, that it should be an easy enough goal to achieve. Um, it doesn't seem like the road we're reaching. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, there's lots of businesses. It's much harder to plan for reopening um the the hours so they, they need to be pretty pretty accurate with these dates so uh, i can't see them changing that much i think guys should be ready to go back from april 26th uh, in regards to tests i did hear the same note about this whole week beforehand thing um i don't think that's something the dvsa wants to do because that's a whole week of tests that they're not going to be able to do um but uh, i i don't know where that rumor came from or if it's just a rumor if it was confirmed but um up until the la when it happened last time, tests went back the day that happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, expect a, a few fails was, the first week. <laughs> yeah, it was well when I when I last spoke to um, guy DVSA Michael Warner, who's right. um, communication some brother. Um, uh, that was his. That was what they wanted to plan to do that to actually. You know, start lessons and then test around a, a week later. I'm um, saying so again, whether it'll actually happen or not is another matter. He hasn't told me that because <laughs> I don't think he knows himself. <laughs> just, just actually think on that. Does anybody have any information in regards to the 75 examiners that are still supposed to, just supposed to be taken on? Because obviously, the training has the training for these guys been held back, or are these guys going to be hitting the field pretty soon? It's another. Yeah. Good point. Yes. As far as I know, the, um, the the cutoff date for applications isn't isn't um, hasn't been there. Like, it, it, well, it may well be tomorrow, but as, as as far as I know, you can still apply up to now. And obviously, right. then there'll be there'll be the there'll be the interview and everything else. Well, then the online test that they have to do, the interview, the situation. Yeah, I, just, I don't know. I just wonder if these guys are going to be able to train at all until that that date. You know, let's say it's the 12th of April. Is there going to be no training for these guys until that date? Like down in, it's obviously not at Cardington anymore, but, you know, no, is that going to happen or not? Okay. Let's come on. So. <laughs> Couple to the 5th of March. <laughs> 5th of March. Right, okay. 
do you know any, for their online assessment. Yeah. Do you know any instructors who have um, uh, chucked it in and decided to become an examiner? Uh, not in this wave. I know an instructor that did it last time, mm -hmm. um, but um, not this time that I know of so far. Yeah, I, I know of one who's applying. Um, really coming out of his own personal situation had to the lockdown and lack of and lack of cash looking for more stability. That's why he's doing it. Uh, yeah, the, the instructor that I know that done it, he literally had just qualified and then lockdown happened. So he was he was sitting fine. <laughs> he was in a perfect position, fully paid the whole time he was off. So I've got, um, got a question from uh, David um, Allen, I think it is. I think it's David Allen. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, um, advice on health and safety uh, after COVID. Uh, well, during COVID, when going back during COVID. You guys want to go first? Um, I thought about that one as well. I'm not really quite sure. Why I, I would have thought we'd, we'd just go back to what we were doing in November, or sorry, in December. Um, I can't see really any difference in what we've been already been doing. Unless, of course, you've had two jabs, in which case you can lick the door handles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I just want to sort of mirror what Mike was saying. Um, I think last time this happened, it was very interesting. There was very little guidance for driving instructors put out, especially us. I mean, I was doing a little bit of key worker training. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no guidance given to us what we should do in regards to car, but all of us were automatically wiping down surfaces between lessons, making people use hand sanitizer when they got in the vehicles. Um, none of these stupid screens or any of that sort of stuff. Um, and nothing was reported in regards to driving instructors being a problem. Uh, obviously, we went back after the first lockdown in Scotland, and um, the advice then was pretty much everything that we'd already been doing. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to the level of um, nuking my car with these foggers or any of that sort of thing. Um, but wiping down the surfaces in between lessons, covering your face when you cough, obviously wearing face masks now. Um, uh, yeah, but I think you also need to establish what level the pupil is at in regards to, are they nervous about coming back in the car with you? Uh, letting them know beforehand what measures you're already taking in the car you know hey guys the car is getting wiped down in between lessons i'm going to ask you to do hand sanitizer when you come in if we're going to do any long briefings we'll do them outside the car weather permitting uh things like that and then, then they can come in and feel self you know nice and safe in the environment that you're you're teaching in yeah that's, that's, that's good i mean are you going to ask your pupils um about uh where they're at with covid if uh, you're still going to ask if they've they've uh had a cold or anything like that or if they've had a vaccine, how we we track that sort of data with you people? I'll be asking people uh, that <laughs> if they have any symptoms. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to say, I think that could, I think that's a reasonable question to ask. No, because um, obviously during lockdown one and two, a vaccine was there. No, um, and point coming out of lockdowns one and two, um, but I think that is a reasonable question. But it goes back to what I said earlier, trying to maybe perhaps. Maybe not leave that for a conversation for the car. Have that as a conversation before they get booked back in. Yeah. Okay. So I think another thing we're, yes. we're forgetting here is that the mm. vaccination doesn't stop you from getting COVID. No. It no. just no, it prevent, or, or passing on. It just it just lowers the risk end up in hospital or dying because of it. So there's still going to be people floating around with it. It's the chances again are still as high. <laughs> um, but you know, so the vaccination is not the be all and end all of it trying to reduce the transmission in between lessons is the way yes. to go about it. Absolutely. Yep, spot on. Um, Mike, do you have anything to say on that about before we move on? Or? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, say, you have a <clears throat> very good idea, actually, to, um, you know, to, to add that as a, as a question way beforehand. Um, to say, yes, you know, have you or in your family, you know. Um, uh, again, we, I, I mean, uh, I presume we all did that anyway. Um, we sent out um, text messages to our pupils um, with a, a big long list of stuff saying, you know, had you had COVID, had any of your family had COVID, are you isolating, blah, 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 blah. Um, so yes, um, really, we're, we're, <clears throat> um, we're just going back to, to exactly what we were doing before and the same, um, the same things. Hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer, it won't be so bad with the window open. 
<laughs> and if you want to do that during uh, February. Um, what about um, so earnings? Let's talk about about, about earnings. Um, like, how do you feel? How did you guys handle the loss of earnings in the last year? Uh, what right advice do you have to ADIs uh, to 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 make up loss earnings? Do you have uh, advice around that? I think this is your t- question, Tony. That's all you start. Um, yeah. Well, yes. This this was something that I thought of, and I know this. The, 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 this has drawn mixed responses from ADIs up and down the land, because there's been those able to claim the size payments. There's been those able to claim the universal credit payments. There's been those able to claim the um, the additional restriction grant. And there's been some that's been able to, or not been able to claim any of those. The additional restriction grant appears to fluctuate in A criteria and B payments for successful applicants from location to location. You know, Jamie will be able to confirm this. Uh, Currently, our local council in Leeds will give you one off payment of pounds. And that's open to ADIs, by the way. Um, but it's been widely reported that Scottish ADIs are getting four grand. Sure. So it's been a mixed bag for a lot of people and it's caused a lot of heartache for a lot of people. Um, the advice I would say, I mean, I know we're very late in the day now, but what I would say is, is anybody that hasn't explored every conceivable avenue to get a payment or to get support, still look for it be it mortgage breaks, pension breaks, any, anything you can put on hold, uh, look at that. In terms of going forwards and getting back, there would be a strong argument for immediately putting your prices up. The demand's going to be there, you know, and everything else. But my own, and this is why I, won't do it, I wouldn't do it, certainly straight away, is possibly consider how your pupils will feel. They've not had lessons for months, and then they're suddenly coming back, and you've put your prices up. I mean, I don't know what the other members of the panel are, you know, the other members that have joined the the the, uh, the call feel about that today. But personally, it isn't something I would do immediately. Go straight back on the twelfth or put the prices up. Could you do I like do um, for existing pupils? It's the same price pre lockdown, and then anyone you take on up, like take on new, it's at a new rate. Okay. Could you do that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, you could do that. Yep. But again, you know, that's it's not really for me to say what individuals would do. Oh, no. I, I just I feel about it. Yeah. You know, um, but another another temptation, and justifiable, a justifiable temptation would be there to do it, and reasons to do it. It's just something that I wouldn't think of immediately, personally. Don't know what other guys think. I'll just give you my my two on that. Um, firstly, you're right; it's four thousand pounds in Scotland. However, there has been massive, massive problems with people actually getting this money. My myself was refused because they couldn't confirm my identity. <laughs> my partner, who applied on the same day, uh, hasn't even heard anything back. Um, so it's um, Stuart Lockery from the NJC has thankfully been very useful in getting in contact with he's got contact with the Scottish government who hopefully getting something sorted out and have acknowledged that there is issues. Um, but um, for example, in my case, it was my bank account statement says Mr. J. A. Sheriff and everything else is Jamie Sheriff. And that is the only place that we can see that there's any particular issue. Well, I'm sorry, they asked for the statements to be as they were. <laughs> so that's what you've given them. Um, there has been lo- lots of problems with, the, with these grants. Um, another thing as well is that, like Tony was saying, there's a lot of people haven't applied for places where the revenues of money might be just like phoning up for example we've done it one of our cars just phoning up saying uh we still can't work at the moment um can we extend the payment holiday on it and they're like yeah sure so okay it means that your your you know your finance runs a little bit longer but who cares it's fine um so managing some of those costs in regards to going back to business and putting prices up i'm actually going to be adopting a very similar figure to yourself michael is i'm at the moment i do a uh, peak and on peak pricing it's going to be changing to just a flat rate. Uh, but what I'll be doing is I'll be honouring my old price system for the first two, three months um, to all my current pupils and everybody else. The website already has the, the new prices on there. Um, but I'm not 
going above what my peak price was previously. Um, I don't think that's really fair to be doing. And to be honest with you, um, there is a lot of support out there. People just need to be looking for it. Thanks, Jimmy. That's brilliant. Thanks. Uh, Mike? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> um, the um, additional restrictions grant, um, uh, yes, it is it, very um, um, unevenly distributed. Um, there's uh, the uh, borough next to me, um, Brentwood Borough Council, actually contacted driving instructors and said, look, we've got some money for you. Come and have it. Um, Epping Forest Council, the area I live in, has said basically, bugger off. <laughs> They've now changed that a bit because I wrote to um, the leader of the council and to my local MP who put pressure on the council. So now they have changed that a little bit. They now have included um, taxi drivers. Not driving instructors, <laughs> but I'm hoping that is kind of the same thing. But yes, it, you know, if, if you haven't got it, you know, bung pressure on your on your councillor, on your MP um, to try and change that. Because um, I believe even though I read something this morning, actually, that um, uh, Parliament was um, uh, in, run an inquiry into why councils are sitting on millions of pounds of money and haven't been doing anything with it. You know, been given all this money and they're just sitting on it doing nothing um so um yes it, it needs to be you know you, you need you know if, if you're not getting it you know get off your bum and, and pressurize them definitely so right just right mirror something mike says it actually from right. what i've heard everywhere just wait to mirror something mike was just saying everywhere i've heard of taxi drivers are getting prioritized mm. they've been able to work through this whole thing yeah mm. You know, private hire guys from, from day one could work the whole way through the situation. We were told you have to stop, it's against the law. So surely to God, we should be getting prioritised with these discretionary funds above them. I don't, no disregards to taxi drivers who appreciate the business has fallen, but it has not completely ended in the way as ours has. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a really good point. Excellent, thanks. Um, thanks both of you guys. Um, yeah, um, so uh, before we move on, uh, just a few things in the charts. Um, yeah, uh, Part, Jeanette just said uh, Nicola Sturgeon's confirmed that due to administration errors, uh, the people will not lose out, apparently. So, yes, I just want to follow quickly note on that. I was watching that announcement. Nicola Sturgeon said that she would not miss out on any administrative errors that were taking place mm -hmm. on their site. She did not say if the error was made on the person who applied site. Right. And they made it very clear on it initially that once you apply, you're not going to be able to reapply. <laughs> that okay. hopefully looks like it is getting changed. But um, it's, uh, it shows very much the case of, oh, if we've made a mistake, we'll fix it. But if you've made a mistake, she never clarified on if you make a mistake, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, rectified. Also, there was only a window of four weeks to apply for this. Yeah, yeah. We're two and a half weeks into this now. So a few of us are getting tight bum syndrome, going, oh, we've still not heard anything yet. And we're getting towards the end. Also, the emails that they were using was going into everybody's junk folder. <laughs> and it was a, 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 a handle called biz.scot or something like that. So most people weren't even realizing they're getting emails back. Myself, I've had emails go into my normal folder and my junk folder. So um, it, it's not that great. So if all I will say is anybody in Scotland who has had any issues um, and you've been refused and you don't think you should be refused and all the rest of it, Contact Stuart Lockery. He has got a couple of lists on the go, which he has sent to his contact. I did hear of people who were on the first list get their approved today, um, who were originally refused. Uh, myself, I'm on the second list, so I'm hoping I get an uh, email in a couple of days' time. But um, uh, yeah, if, if you're having problems, also contact your local MP in regards to this, um, because uh, it's fairly hefty chunk of money yes, that's available. Absolutely. Massively, yeah. Um, no, great point again. Um, sh to move on, uh, there was a question around, and I think it's quite a big one, because uh, I did a poll recently on, uh, I'm, a face I'm a driving instructor on an ADI, PDI, uh, and I'm on Facebook, and I'm super positive. Um, and <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I put a question on what you're most anxious about. Um, and about going back to work. And one of the biggest things was managing your waiting list. Uh, so I wanna like uh, spend a little bit of time on just like, how are you, like, how do you feel, like, 
stop yourself getting overwhelmed about going back? Like, how do you, uh, what can you do there? Um, I know we kind of touched on it a little bit before, but just I think it's worth, that was the number one thing that all EDIs were saying they were a bit worried about. So how do we, how do we reduce the stress around that? Historically, I never really had a way in this, Michael. I either said yes to people and got them in, or if I couldn't, I said no. Right. And that was okay. just how I operated. Um, things have actually changed. I've, I had people booked in my diary for, or, or getting people ready um, to join from November. And at the moment now, I've got 11 people waiting. Um, so, it, believe it or not, after 17 years, managing a waiting list is quite new to me because I never really did it. I either got them in or I just said no. Um, but the way, I'm, the way I'm doing it is I will prioritise those that have been waiting the longest. Right. So, my, my November inquirers, I will get them in first. Those that inquired next week, I'll just say you'll have to wait and they may well then drop off. Because yep. I don't anticipate getting all 11. I think when we go back to work, you know, some of these people will look for somebody else, which is fine. But in terms of managing the list, it's those that inquired further back. Well, I, I initially, that's how I used to do it. Uh, but now I ask some specific questions. When are they going to be available? So um, if, say, it's uh, the hot after school slot, you know that there's lots and lots of people on those. But if you know when they want that, when I tell them, they say, look, okay, yeah, you're, you're number 11 on the list. You know, they immediately drop, oh, God, I've got, 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 got 10 more people before me you take on before you get to mine. I said, well, not really, because um, it depends on when you want the lesson. So if you want the lesson, um, if you want the lesson slot of a person who um, has just passed their test, then, yeah, you can have that one because otherwise it's going to be empty. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't do it necessarily um, first come first serve, it's where they fit hmm. is what I see the best way to do it for me. Yeah. In, in my case, I think it really comes down to how prior to this you managed your calendar and how you went around about contact with your pupils. Um, some people I know still pen and paper, they wait on a phone call, they answer it, they put them in a diary. Myself, everything's online. People fill out an inquiry form, there's questions on there. And from that, I can establish if I can get them in quicker or later, depending on time and location, uh, stuff like that. Um, it really depends on the previous the instructor's previous methods of communication. Uh, and like I say to you, it takes us very back to the very first thing that I answered, which is the first thing we should be doing is communication. You should be looking at is your communication type at the moment suitable or could you improve it? You've got all this downtime to make changes. You could you could take some of that time and go, you know what, I'm maybe going to do an inquiry form or I'm going to make sure I fill out this, these questions when I speak to people on the phone. Because when they phone up, sometimes I just, you know, I find no worries and you know, I'll speak to you later. Um, it just go down, you know, some put some organisation into place that you may not have had before to make your life easier. Good point. <clears throat> In fact, uh, actually, it was um, when 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 times were harder and it was more difficult to get pupils. Um, there was um, a uh, a line. Um, God, I can't think of the guy's name now. He doesn't do it anymore. Um, lives in lives in France. What's the what's the guy's name? Lives in France. Living pool and pool. That's it. <laughs> Not exactly the person everybody loves. Um, I remember the first time I met him. Phys I physically met him. He 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 um, he was extremely pissed actually <laughs> but um and he's a he's a right strange character but he came out with a perfect line for when um you know when when you're when you're trying to get pupils to book with you and uh, and that simple line was um i can help you pass your test and it, it is a it's such a, a positive line it and it works you know you people around say yeah i want to do driving lessons and um first of all you you never answer the um, when they ask say what well, if they if they call up and say what's your price never tell them your price first of all not unless you're pissed off and you couldn't be bothered to do anything um, but other than that you talk about everything else but the price and you put it in at the end 
and always say that they, that magic line works really well. I can help you pass your test because that's what they want to hear. And it works. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's it's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's, it's a definite sales ploy, but it bloody well works. <laughs> Which is funny because if you go by the, the statistics that the DVSA just put out again uh, last week, um, a driving instructor doesn't help you to pass your test. No, that's right. But <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, it's 2% lower. Oh, you're helping them in a way, aren't that you? Report. Can you talk a little bit about that report? That'll be really interesting. So basically, whenever they go into a car, they know if the vehicle is a driving instructor's vehicle or if it's a private runner. So uh, the pass rates on the private runners consistently over years has been 2% higher uh, yeah. every time. So uh, our driving instructor doesn't help you to pass your test. No. School of mum and dad is absolutely perfect, yeah. apparently. Yeah. I, I wonder I wonder whether, because somebody made this point actually on Facebook, they said that uh, perhaps it's because they haven't got a brake to put their foot on. <laughs> and that, that, that may be the reason why they don't, um, you yeah, that they do pass because they can't stop them. They've got to wait until they put their foot on the brake. It is the classic uh, thing that's been debated many times, and I've said it to several people from the DVSA, that when you t a private person turns up, they take them on a nice, easy route, country route, that, mm. you know, is very uneventful, and they'll get a pass <laughs> out because they're worried about particular things. They're like, they'll, they'll stay away from that mega hard roundabout with the lane mm. markings are a bit shaky. Um, uh, DVSA denies it totally. Um, mm. But... Um, they, they're denying it because it's the official policy, but what mm. they're not taking into, control, into uh, mind here is human factor of risk to yeah. oneself, and yeah. nobody wants to die. <laughs> so, well. and you're you, and as an examiner, you're meeting a pupil you've never ever met before. So you have no, you know, okay, you might be able to look at the driving instructor and go, mm. oh, this pupil should be alright. He usually brings up decent pupils, but if there's no instructor and they're just this random person you're having to assess this person go right where am I going to take them am I going to go take yeah. them straight onto the dual carriageway and you know do the emergency stop on that road and pull them over on that road no I'm going to take them the country road where I know at you know 11 o'clock is really quiet um I think that's human human will to live as it uh, comes into play there which the DVSA don't take into uh, uh, into their reports human nature right yeah, absolute human nature spot on oh, like, yeah sorry Michael just going back to what Mike was saying about price, I just noticed a very, very a, a point that uh, Gavin raised in the chat that you mentioned the price, and then you know if I mean I know I know as consumers we're all consumers and we shop around, yep. but there might be a bit of psychology at play in terms of the price, because if people are prioritising the cost of their lessons over willingness to learn and look and not looking at the end goal it might give you a little bit of an idea mentally of what kind of pupil that person's going to be. Because if they're putting up a stumbling block immediately over the price you charge, not the service that you offer and the standard that you offer it, you know, might it lead to further, I don't know, conflict down the line. So I think he, make, I think he makes a point there. Good point. I mean, I think the, um, the ones that are very, very price orientated will ring you up and the first thing to say is hi what's what's your lesson price without saying anything else that's the first thing they say what's your lesson price In which case you give it because you know for well they're they're ringing round this i say you know hi oh yeah I'm, I'm looking for driving lessons uh blah 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 what's your lesson price you know that there it's, it's a secondary thing and of course in the end you know when it's a, a sales pattern thing um you know you um you 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 ask you know, you ask for the sale um but also you you sell somebody something before you give the price because you want to make sure they're interested in it and then you give them the price because really if you sold it properly the price is immaterial absolutely absolutely yeah. i'd also like to say that i prioritize pupils that are recommended to me over everybody else so if i've taught somebody you know you're going up to the top of my list already because there's not any questions about price and anything you've there's a recommendation they've mm. already a certain level of trust placed in you yeah, yeah. that's a good point i like that <laughs> I, I read, rip c uh, added uh five magic words can you tell me more uh and quite often that's a great sales technique right it gets yeah. people talking more and 
yeah. So that's all the good one to use on people's. Uh, nice one, thanks for that. Um, is there anything else want to do? Anything else want to go on that topic, or should we move on to another topic? No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, what's... Well, um, so, uh, next topic about um, new lady eyes. Um, actually, actually, there was a question in the chat. Sorry about on that topic. It was about uh, taking upfront payments. Um, so, would you recommend taking upfront payments? Uh, I'm quickly just going to nip in there and say. I always recommend instructors take upfront payments. It reduces risk. Uh, something with Gorodi, we always, when people take uh, a pupil from us, we the first thing that we show the instructor is like, use us to get an upfront payment. And we do that as a free service because um, we actually have this, uh, like uh, you take a pupil and if they don't get in your car, we have to get you the next pupil for free. So it, it, <laughs> the only way we make money is if you get a good pupil. And the way we find that is, well, we need to get you, if you get a referral, like a, a, an upfront payment, the chances of them dropping out are almost zero at that point. So it just increases the commitment. And so we always encourage instructors to take upfront payments. That's my view. Uh, and I, I think there's, there's different mechanisms to do that. What do you, do you guys do that? And what, do, what mechanisms do you use to take upfront payments if you do it? I think that comes back to pricing. Because if somebody's operating at thirty pounds an hour and, and but then advertise if you pay ten up front, that's two eighty and twenty eight an hour. That that can that can inform upfront payments, can't it? But and well, there's a there's a cautionary tale with this, and again, purely because it's uh, you know unknown circumstances and unknown things that we're in now. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and it's the guy who has gone to is applying to be a driving examiner. Um, and he seems to, all he seems to take from what he said is upfront payments. Um, he's not working currently as an ADI. He hasn't got any government funding, and he's going to owe his pupil two thousand eight hundred pounds worth of lessons. If he gets the examiner job, he'll have to pay them back with currently money. Now I know this will be a different argument, mm. but he's going to have to pay them all back. The 2,800, not 2,800 quid per pupil, but he's accrued nearly three grand in advance payments, which he's not been able to deliver on the lessons for because he can't work. Mm. So he gets the examiner job, depending on when he starts, he'll have to do 100 hours to get to, to clear the 2,800 or just pay them back. Um, you know, but it goes back to, I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got a mixed bag personally. I've got some pupils that do pay up front, but not many, I'd probably say 25% that do that and 75% either pay cash weekly or bank transfer weekly. I've, I've never been big on upfront, payment, upfront payments. Um, so I suppose there's, there's arguments for and against, there's pitfalls and there's advantages, you know. So that's, you know, that's me. Yeah. I suppose really, yeah, I mean, the, the upfront payments, it, yes, if you're paying for, you know, 10 or 20 hours in advance or whatever, um, uh, yeah, there's always that that risk that um, they may say, "Well, I want the money back now." Oops, I spent it, um, or things like that. But um, certainly, we're in a um, we're as instructors, we're in a, a, a unique place where we're in a um, a buyer's market, um, and so we can dictate. We're, you know, we're we're very very fortunate that way. Mm. Um, yeah, so we have a well. My, oh, if you don't have a waiting list, maybe you can't. But if you, most of us have a waiting list, so yes, we can dictate what we want. And if you want uh, people to pay in advance, great. You know, it's uh, or you know, pay before they um, they enter the car. Then that's that's much better. You can ask for it, and that's what people will give you because uh, they're lucky. They feel lucky. They've got um, you as a driving instructor for starters, anyway. Yeah, I think some things would also have to be a, a happy medium. In some of this, it's going to depend on the instructor. When you go into all the prepayment type things, there is a certain level of organisation that you have to do, Absolutely. which is all time consuming. And you know, for us as instructors, particularly in independent, you're in a car, you have no good time to answer the phone, do an email because you're busy travelling between pupils. And if anything like myself, I do eight in the morning till ten at night. I do a very very long day. So for me, my time on the computer is ten o'clock at night. I can't phone pupils at ten o'clock at night. Um, so um, for me, there is a mixture of 
those who want to pre-book, who want to pay a, buy a block, that is totally fine. They can do that. Once you've got that money, also what you do with it once you've taken it is also key. Like Tony was just saying, there are some that will just go, oh, it's in my bank account. I'm going to spend it. There's others like Jeanette in the comments yeah. who's saying that she puts it into a separate account and mm -hmm. takes it out once the pupil uses it. That's a great way of doing it. Previously, when I worked in a small local franchise, um, when I first started out, that's what they done. They took the block payment, and then I, every week when I done the lesson, they gave me the money from it, um, that block. And it was if the event there was any issues, the money could go back if it if it ever had to. Um, but I think there's some things as a happy medium, and it comes down to the instructor again. Is that instructor a pen and paper type of guy, or is it that guy who likes to have the tech in the car, likes to have the card reader? Um, another thing as well, these card readers are great. I've got one. But you know what? You're paying two and a half percent when you could be getting zero percent of a bank transfer. So there's all these little things to take into consideration. Two percent doesn't sound like a lot, but when you get a thousand pound at the end of the year for that two percent, you go, "Oh, that was quite expensive for me to have that big card machine in the car." Oh, um, yeah. So it's a balancing act, really. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I echo Jeanette's point. I think that was excellent. You keep it in a different account. What we do is we don't transfer the money to the instructor until they mark the lesson as delivered. Uh, yeah. So they mark the lesson as delivered. Once that's done, we transfer it into the, their account. And that way, it helps them kind of separate what they're actually, once they deliver a service, they can take care of it. And I think that seems kind of, I think that seems fair. Uh, we're running short in time, so I just kind of wanted to move on to a really, uh, a, an important question, I guess, is for newer ADIs. We might, might have some newer ADIs in the in the uh, group. Um, and what would you do, for those who don't have a big reputation, uh, what would be your big piece of advice for them on how they could, um, get themselves out there and get, get new people's after lockdown. Join your local association. Right. Love it. Who <laughs> would like to start? Go on then, I'll start. Um, oh, yeah. Right. Don't, and this is a phrase I use, don't willfully isolate. It can be a very, very lonely job, particularly if you're independent right from the off. Um, Join an association, find a buddy, get yeah. networking, find some support for anything, some business support, somebody who can give you some help and advice. You know, there's a common misconception amongst, well, there has been years ago, the members of the public that think we're all cutthroat and we're out to chop each other's heads off to get business. Um, and no, but they don't realise that there's a lot of help and advice out there in between instructors. So don't suffer in silence. Don't question yourself in silence with no answers. You know, use Facebook, word of mouth. It, it can be effective right from day one. Everybody's got friends and family that know people that have suddenly become instructors. Put the word out. Yep. You know, Facebook has been wonderful for me. You know, taking the, little, taking the little picture, tagging them in, tagging all the friends in. It's been absolutely fantastic. I don't use a website. I've never needed a website, ever. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying everybody's like that, and I'm not. And I'm not. Um, you know, I'm not criticising anybody that has. You work. For, it works for you the way it works for you. But going back to the new ADI, just don't suffer on your own. Get talking to somebody, even if even if you don't know another ADI, but you you see one at the test centre while we're out also outside freezing in these conditions. Just talk. Don't stay on your own. Um, anyway, that, that's info about standing outside test centres because, you know, I don't like it. <laughs> I'd, I'd agree, Tony. I mean, um, echo e exactly that. And of course, yes, the, the, the valuable information you glean from other instructors when you stand outside test centres. Brilliant. You know, there's, there's loads and loads of stuff you're, you're learning about where they get a car from, where they get insurance from, how much work they got, how they get it. It's all that stuff there. And, it's, it, and they could have been working for years. And it's, it's all very, very useful stuff. Um, the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, as, a, as a, a newer ADI, well, uh, what can I say? The, um, uh, the, um, everything could be better for you, really, because we're short on ADIs. So um, uh, there's, you know, the, it should be easier for them to get work um, as long as they make sure people can find them. Yep, read that. Yeah, you know, there, there's there's an abundance of work out there. Um, make sure that people know that you are you're there. 
Yeah. That's why I, I say, you know, our association at the very beginning was one of the things we actively do is that we encourage other members in the association. So, you know, if, for example, somebody phones me and I'm based in West Edinburgh and they go, oh, I'm looking for something in Muscle Brown, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. But if you're looking for that, you look for a female instructor, um, Susan Furlong over there mm -hmm. or, you know, whoever that I know in that area. And then if I'm short on that, I go, go to the association website. It's got a whole list of instructors and what areas they cover and what things they cover. So um, get yourself involved in the association. There's so much experience and knowledge there uh, that you can take into a social environment um, and learn from it. I, I, I see somebody, I, I I see somebody popped up the question about the ICO. Did, uh, everyone, did everyone get that letter? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm registered with it. <laughs> Uh, uh, Cole Rode, Rode's registered with it uh, as of yeah. uh, the other day. But... <laughs> got two, got two registrations actually, um, but yes, that's uh, yeah. You, you keep people's information. Yeah, yeah just do it, and it's it's um, you can make a lot of money, don't they? Like uh, if if like uh, we're getting charged for it, and all you guys are getting charged for it. Jeez, that's mm. yeah. Well, it's only what thirty five quid, isn't it? I think. 30, Instructors have said that it's just it's just another tax on us at the end of the day. Um, it's okay, pay it. The problem is once you're in their system, you're stuck paying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, no, no Timina. Yeah, we. Um, I think we all need to pay that. Um, right. Um, is uh, last question before we wrap up. I guess um, is now a good time to be a driving instructor. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely yes, yeah. Although we shouldn't, should we? I mean that that's how we're keeping our prices up, and uh, we get lots of work because there isn't enough of us around. Um, so yeah, there, I'm, I'm sure there will be an influx of, of new instructors, especially when you've got people who have been made redundant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's uh, I don't know how the how the rest of you all came along to be instructors. Did you know, of course your wife was an instructor, wasn't it, Jamie? Yeah. So just what one thing to point out is the two year. The two years prior to COVID, mm. we were rammed. Mm. We were already rammed. <laughs> so yeah. MD new coming into, into the industry, there is going to be an overabundance of business there. You'd also mm. remember, you're going to have a, so many people who have been let down by public transport over the past year and are like, I don't want that happening to me again. And I ain't paying a fortune in taxis every day. So I'm going to learn to drive a car, even if it's the little automatic one litre thing to get me to to and from work there's going to be a massive influx uh, of of pupils now is the time we've got uh, to to join one thing i will say though is don't join the big three <laughs> go speak to a local trainer your local association mm. find something even if it's a little local it has even if it's a franchise but a local franchise you're going to be much better looked after than you will from Red BSM AA get myself in trouble. I don't care. Um, they, they know what I think about them already. Um, I, I mean, I, I run a little tiny franchise myself, and it is all focused on looking after the instructors. You know, I pay for the association meetings, nights out, pre training every year. It is all about and encouraging these guys to go solo and helping them with building websites and all this sort of stuff. But go speak to somebody local who will give you good advice, who will sit down, have a coffee with you, and we'll, well when we're allowed to have a coffee, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, we'll guide you through it. Find yourself a really good mentor. Uh, just to point out, Gavin is in the talk. Gavin was my mentor, I guess you could say. Um, and yeah, he done that for me. Those are gonna be fair. I mean, I, I trained with the AA driving school and the trainer I had, was was absolutely fine. I've got to be careful because actually, you know, AA, BSM, Red, etc., uh, are also my 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 clients too. <laughs> so yeah. I, can't, I can't be horrible to them. Um, but they they are what they are. I mean, you you will have good ones, you will have bad ones. Um, uh, but I suppose if I was retraining again, I probably wouldn't choose one of the big three. I just noticed something here. This is a story that Michael knows about. Um, I was privy, I'm not going to say who's who was everything, but I just happened to be at a meeting who happened to be sitting opposite the owner of one of these big uh, three and uh, happened to divulge how many PDIs that they currently had on the go. And the number, which was in the thousands, astounded me. 
And all of these guys were being encouraged to go onto pink badges so that they could sell them cars. Um, and that for me is, it's not, I would love these big companies to look after the pupils and the instructors, as opposed to just how many minis can I sell this year? It needs to change. Um, and hopefully, I hate to say this, COVID has damaged these big guys. Big time. Uh, AA is, you know, we already know the reason what they're doing as they're doing to the instructors is because they're having money troubles on the other end. They were trying to be really good at the beginning because the perception of AA has been pretty good recently. Um, but they've realized, oh, we're helping out maybe too much back then and it's created problems for us now. Some of these other big guys, they've got problems that they're having to work behind the scenes, but maybe this is the chance for the local instructors to come out because I'll guarantee you every advert in Intelligent Instructor magazine coming up is going to be earned 40 grand with red. And, and work people, are people, are, people are smiling <laughs> and nodding because they don't want it. Yeah, every, every no, knows, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I, I don't care. But, um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what it is. What I would say, my advice would be if anybody uh, is thinking about it or anybody who knows anybody who's thinking about it, don't get cunned into parting with large amounts of money up front for training. Yes. I, I, you know, if I, if I was thinking of starting, echoing what Mike said, echoing what Jamie said, uh, find somebody local, find somebody local who's willing to take you on, on, you know, a, a price per hour, like you do, like like you do with learners, rather than stumping up lots of money up front because you don't know how it's going to work out, you don't know whether you're going to like it, you don't know whether you're going to pass your exams, and then you suddenly feel fog out, out of pocket, so. I would, I would, I would take caution with anybody looking for money up front, a lot of money up front. Um, that would be my advice. Or say yeah, you in for two years. I'm sorry, uh, can you say, say yeah. again? So the whole signing you in for yeah. 12, 24 months, just, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, but in terms of being a good time, yes, I think it is a good time. Uh, but I know Gavin again made the point will be absolutely stacked for a couple of, you know, maybe a couple of years. I don't know whether that will be in the long term. No, you know, I think it will be. I think, I think, I think we... I think, we, you yeah, know. I think we... I think we've got to prepare ourselves for um, a more lean period. Yeah, I think the two years prior to COVID, though, well, in Scotland anyway, was, oh. was right for the picking. You know, everybody's calendars were full before that. So... Um, if that continues, great. Yeah, I, I, great I know it was specifically in Edinburgh. I know Edinburgh had a huge, huge backlog because when we started doing our user testing for Go Roadie, uh, like Dundee was fine, Aberdeen was fine, Glasgow was fine. Uh, but when we started doing user testing, uh, people in Edinburgh instructors were just like, I'm too busy. Uh, they were just like, not, they were just too busy. Oh. Uh, so we're just like, okay, we'll, we'll come back to Edinburgh another time. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Uh, totally. uh, no, uh, yeah, we're, we're too busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, just one last thing I would say. Sorry, Michael. Just one last thing I would say. Um, and Mike alluded to it earlier about things being done during lockdown. I, I, I've never been a, a, a disciple of putting all my eggs in one basket. And I'm also a believer in that you can never have too many strings to your bow. Yes, we can make a lot of hair with learners. But what if that dries up? Consider diversification, consider retraining, assessor, get yourself a teaching qualification, a basic one, fleet work, ADI training. And I know a lot of people on this call will be doing, be doing that already, but it's not the be all and end all to just do learners. I did that the first six years I qualified and then left to go do another job for four years. When I came back, I got my fleet badge and diversified. So there's there's that as well to consider as well. It's not just about learners. Um, I would agree with that. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. To diversify, don't don't rest on one thing, because uh, yeah, well, if that dries up, it's like um, it, it's it's like having a company that has one big account and uh, uh, putting your yeah resting on that. When that big account goes, you're buggered. <laughs> Uh, I've got just a couple of questions that kind of clear up before we finish. Uh, Tamina is asking, uh, are instructors allowed in the back of, 
fucking car. Uh, so can I can I just quickly come in this because I was just reading this and wanted to answer it. Thanks. So I'm going to be controversial again. Examiners are allowed to sit in the back of your car for a test on a standards check, but you're not allowed to sit in the back of your own vehicle for a driving test. That is wrong. And I will be booking my standards check when it comes up. And when they come out to get in my car, I'll say to them, oh, no, you're not allowed in the back of my car. Simple. And I already know that doesn't go down as a fail. That goes down as a we couldn't actually do the test. Yeah. Um, but the, the examiner is going into an area which we're, we've spread COVID all over. Yeah, it's our car. We've coughed in it, whatever. But they deemed it safe enough to go in. But on test, we're not to sit in the back of the car of our own vehicle. It's totally contradictory. Totally. Yeah, something's not right there. Um, okay, don't have an instructor coughing over the examiner. I totally get that. But um, establish that nobody's got any COVID symptoms and the instructor should be allowed to sit in the back of the car, particularly when the test centres are closed. We'll wait and see what happens in that regard when things start to open up again. Um, uh, thankfully, the weather is getting better. But, yeah. Uh, at the moment, we don't. We haven't had, actually had clarification from DVSA about this, um, but it looks it looks like they're going to go back to the same standards of the procedure standards the SOPs that they had in place beforehand, uh, which means you're not yeah. in the back of your car in a test. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah, I've I've actually heard that as well, Jamie. And furthermore, the, the, the SOPs are still going to be extended to commit a serious fault and you're back after ten minutes. Yeah. That, that's still going to be in, that's still going to be in practice um, as well. There's someone, uh, Galaxy S9 wants to talk. Uh, I'll let them uh, say something if they want to say something. Um, are you there? Um, they put their hand up and... Uh... And they're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, coming up. Can you hear me? It's Mike Bell. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hello. I've been listening to you and listening very carefully. Very interesting, thank you. I'm just curious, just a personal thing. Um, what's the hourly rate of lessons for learners in Scotland, please? Um, so, uh, it, it, throughout Scotland, it diversifies a little bit. Um, in Edinburgh, we're definitely at the higher end. Um, automatic lessons are generally £40 an hour. Manual lessons are anywhere between 30 and 35 uh, We encourage, as an association, everybody to price themselves accordingly um, and not to be worried about, oh, I need to be the cheapest in the area. You don't. Uh, your reputation will carry you enough. Uh, it does... As you go around Scotland, it does change. Um, uh, the further north you go, it tends to get a little bit cheaper. Um, but the cost of living is much cheaper up there as well. So it kind of balances I would it. Say, I would say like Dundee, it's like £27 pounds an hour, uh, £30 pounds an hour for an automatic lesson. In Aberdeen, because of the oil, <laughs> it's uh, more <laughs> again. Uh, so that, that goes up again to £32, £35 pounds an hour. And Glasgow, yep. we're looking at around uh, 28 again to 30 Wow, that's impressive. I'm sure there's lots of people in my home locale that lead, same as Tony, don't charge that much. Um, well done. I'm pleased you can manage it. Yeah, we, I always thought for a long time that driving lessons like driving tests should be one price. And if lessons were £30 throughout the country, there would be no shopping around. People would hunt out the best instructor. But that's uh, seemed to elude us for a long, long time. Um, I... I, I don't know whether really that's uh, the the right thing to do. Um, uh, I uh, it's, all right. So you know, I've I've put my lesson prices up um, before, usually before others in my area do, um, and um, so far that actually has worked. So I haven't done it after others. I've been the instigator of it, and it's then others have then followed suit. So um, I always think that you shouldn't be scared of doing it. You shouldn't be scared of it. Just, just try it. You can always put it down again. Exactly. You can always put it down again. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's easy enough to do. You know, you can if you have a website, you can. I'll put it up now. I'll put it down now. Yeah. You know, fiddle around with it. And that's uh, we we all like go We always encouraged to look at the area, look at the and trial put a higher price. Like there's no reason. I I don't feel don't be scared not to put up because it's like you said you can always change. It's like. It's not a, a one-way door decision. It's a two-way door. You can always change it. And I've, I've heard, uh, I've heard so many, like, because I've spoken to thousands of instructors, 
I've heard the stories of like increasing it by five pounds, increasing it by five pounds, increasing it by five pounds. And the learners kept paying, they kept paying, they kept paying. So I wouldn't be scared of putting your prices up. Try it. Yeah. What happens? Yeah, there's something in my area that's just got up to £45 an hour in the past year. And everybody else looking at it going, oh, maybe I could actually do that. <laughs> you know, um, I'm holding back at the moment. I'm, I'm going with the area price, but our area price is quite high already. So. Perfect. Uh, right, thanks, Mike. Um, and I'm last, I'm going to the last question because of time. Uh, this is from Chris Scott Douglas. Do the panel have any opinions on uh, standards checks test might resume? Mike. I can give you an answer on that. I can give you an answer on that right away. Um, they've already announced what the plans are for this. Uh, standards checks are not going to go ahead right away. Uh, everybody that has got the qualification to be doing tests will be going into doing tests. The only test that the, um, uh, I forget the proper name for them now, the um, ADI enforcement team will be doing are the part twos. Um, so they'll do the part twos. They're not concentrating on standards checks at the moment. Uh, that's something that's already been put out there. Um, it's actually what's quite interesting is that they're good, they're creating a problem for themselves. <laughs> um, but it is what it is. So you, nobody's going to get a standards check lesson for a test for quite a wee while. Uh, I wouldn't worry just about that. Um, once the uh, other examiners are all taken on and things start to calm down a little bit, then fair enough. Um, actually, there's another thing that we haven't spoke about at all today, which comes into play. Theory tests. There is a new company that is going to be doing them. Okay. So um, Parsons have kept the contract. It's, it's broken up into three regions. Parsons have lost all of two regions um, and um, they are only involved in one region now. So in, Scot in our case in Scotland, uh, the new company, I forget the name of them off the top of my head, have come in. Um, they don't even have premises <laughs> yet and they're supposed to take over at the end of the year. Um, they may come in so gung-ho that theory tests are really easy to get all of a sudden. We, we just don't know. So it's a massive X factor over the whole thing uh, in regards to theories. And also the fact that they announced that they were not willing to extend theory test certificates after two years. Their excuse was that this was because they have to change legislation, which to a certain degree is true, but it's also bull because they have changed legislation for other things to cater for COVID like that. Yeah. MOTs. The, the, them doing that means that there's a lot of people that have to go back which creates time for them to get other tests out of the way. So it's in the DBSA's interest to not have theory tests extended. Uh, so that's never going to happen either. Uh, there is one final question, final, final question from Rob. Um, do we need to be audit registered uh, to train drive instructors? Uh, I think, as, and uh, J Jamie and I were talking about that this morning, I think, right? Yes, yes, we were. <laughs> no, they do not. Yeah. Um, there is a massive, in my opinion, that my 83-year-old grandmother, who has never driven a day in her life, could teach me to become a driving instructor according to the law. Now, that is just wrong, in my opinion. You've got to be qualified to be a driving instructor. I think there needs to be a qualification that is required to train driving instructors. Um, or that we know has changed recently it's still slightly broken it is not compulsory it is optional but how many people when you train a normal learner go into your car and ask to see your badge nobody do you seriously think this guy who's coming along who's thinking we get an industry knows to ask you about your audit registration no he doesn't so it needs to be compulsory there needs to be a proper system put in place to have a level above adis who are there to qualify the ADIs in the same way you would to get a professional qualification to become a teacher. Yeah. And that's, that's where I stand on it, but yeah. All right. uh, I think we've run out of time there. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, you can email me at michael.gorori.com and I can then uh, CC these guys in. Uh, you can have an email discussion if that's, uh, if that's, if that's good as we want. Uh, but thank you very much. I'll speak to the panelists individually later about uh, to see how, how you guys found that. I hope everyone got something out of that in some way. And uh, we'll be doing this again in April. So thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, thank thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers. Take care.